Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the next adventure of STEM Forward. I am Joel Wilson, one of the co-hosts of STEM Forward, along with the brilliant Dr. Stephen Jones and Dr. John Spencer. Good evening, everybody. You're on mute, Steve. With STEM Forward, our goal is to provide strategies and insight on how K-12 and college students can successfully pursue STEM careers. Tonight, our topic is entertainment, technology, and celebrating life. Our first segment, we're going to talk about technology. How does technology and entertainment feel? How do they intertwine and go together? So our, our distinguished uh, doctors uh, coming to you uh, uh, this month, Dr. John Spencer and uh, Dr. Stephen Jones, and they're going to jump right in uh, with, with their expertise. So we're going to start off with uh, Dr. Jones. Dr. Jones, um, technology, technology in the K-12 space. Technology allows, uh, tell, tell us about uh, how students in a K-12 space can, can use technology to showcase their creativity. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because you were just having a conversation about how uh, one of your high school students created a commercial for you. So <laughs> that is phenomenal that students, you know, at those ages can create, you know, they have that, 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 that creativity to do things in a different way and think things in a different way and open up uh, doors in a different way because they are not afraid of the technology at all. And so I'm I'm excited. I'm excited about this. Absolutely, absolutely. Dr. Spencer, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so so one of the things when when I think about um the use of technology, whether it's for entertainment or, or documenting, I think about some of the early days with, with my father. We got our first VHS camera back in maybe like 1978, 1979, and we were doing home videos and and uh, sometimes on Saturday, we'll get down to the basement with my action figures and, and make movies. And so in a K-12 setting, I know as a principal, I've tried to make sure that we've had technology within our schools that, that children can, can utilize and display their creativity. Because at this point, most children have a handheld device, whether it's a tablet or a uh, phone that can shoot in high definition. Some of the phones can even shoot in 4K. And so my belief as, as um, educators that we have to show them how to use that technology responsibly. So whether it's doing a project for English language arts, social studies, or any of their classes, they can use that handheld technology to make something really breathtaking to, to show their mastery of the subject and to also showcase their creativity. So the sky's the limit with, with various types of, of technology. Very interesting. So, so Dr. Spencer, I actually want to go right back to you with this next question. So um, uh, talk, talk to us about how has technology evolved in the music industry? It's very different than, you know, you and I, we were growing up uh, back in the uh, 70s, 80s. How, so how, how, how is how, how does technology manifest itself in music today? Well, one of the things that um, is very different, I, I have a friend uh, who used to have a studio, but now with, with the development of, of technologies, that, that space that everybody used to try to get into and it costs a lot of money to go to, you can run it from a laptop. Like I bought a mixing machine for my students and a drum machine and they're learning how to use it in school. Matter of fact, we, we have a partnership with a local theater in town and they're using the software. They're showing my students how to make beats and they're uh -huh. doing this in the classroom and they're mm -hmm. able to use their Chromebooks and their phones to make the beats. So, so they don't have to go to the studio. They haven't paid you know, a couple thousand dollars for the latest drum machine or something like that. They're making beats inside the school and the class we're doing this in is a math class because wow. all music is all math. Wow. So, so Dr. Jones, um, you're on the, on the college scene. So how, how do you see music 
playing out with the intersection with technology at the at the college scene? Well, you um, when I think about it from the college side, I think about the instruments that are used in the technology. I'm in the College of Engineering, so these students are developing all the instruments, the electronic instruments, the computers that run them, the software. They're engaged in the whole process of the things that are delivered to these young people to create the music that we hear, whether it's you know out on the street or it's in a theater or it's in a church somewhere. All these things are created using the technology that engineers design. In fact, uh, some of our engineers will go to work for a Sony or one of the production companies in the areas of sound systems. Uh, sound systems have become smaller and smaller. I, I'm sure both of you remember these big uh, speakers <laughs> that used to be everywhere we would go. There would be these huge speakers at concerts and now, you know, in a small little box, you can get a tremendous amount of sound and not even worry about it blowing out the speakers. That's another thing that used to happen back in the old technology. It would actually blow out the speakers. So it's, it's miniaturized, it's uh, more effective, and it is growing across all kinds of industries. And, you know, the idea of training young people to get engaged with it, I think, is, is critical. So, so, Dr. Jones, the only thing I say about that, I, I grew up at the time at the plateau and, you know, folks were on top of the roof with the big speakers. It just would not have been the same environment with little that's speakers right, Joe. on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's right, Joe. I still love my big speakers. <laughs> As a matter of fact, one of the first things I did at my current school was to put in a new sound system uh, within the auditorium. And for the most part, everything is wireless. So, yes, I got my big speakers, but they're not connected um, by cord. I believe it's, it's um, I think, a connected Bluetooth to the main control panel because uh, we also have a band at our school. And one of the things I love about our music teacher is that, you know, she's teaching the children how to set up and use all the equipment. Some of them know how to use it better than I do because we have a wireless um, control system where the whole system can be run from an iPad. Wow. And so when we have shows, sometimes a music teacher or students in the back of the auditorium and she's bringing up sound levels and different mics and everything from the iPad and the the whole system is about the size of a milk, milk crate, wow. you know, mm -hmm. on, on wheels. And so it's not this big, bulky thing you would think it is. But, you know, we have cinema um, stadium type sound within our auditorium. So, that, so that's a great transition there. So, so um, just following up with that, Dr. Jones, can you talk to us about what are some of the career paths? You know, here you may have a young person, they really love music. They, uh, they know a lot of this technology, you know, whether they're an engineering major or maybe a comp sci or maybe even coming from another discipline. But they, they're looking at in the future, you know, can they work in a the theater? Can you make a, a good living um, in, in that field? Yeah, you, I mean, there is um, different ways that they can implement their technology, understanding of technology. I, and like was said earlier, all this wireless technology, they can actually be in one place and project music and sound from an, another place. So it's evolving in such a great way um, that people are looking for individuals with this skill set to come work in their theater, to come work at their university. I know we have different events um, a lot of the, the colleges have their own theaters. And so they need individuals to be able to manage that whole area for um, the, the college. There may be different events that are happening, again, in the college environment. Uh, and you want to make sure even through um, our athletic facilities. So there are many, many different ways that this technology and using this technology can be beneficial. Okay. Okay. So, so doc, Dr. Um, Spencer, can you, can you tell us what, what are some of the instruments where you really see technology being played out where the, the instrument is now really um, a computer? Can you give us well, some examples? Well, before I get into that, Joe, I want to say not only um, sound engineering and things and, and getting the college degree, but, but it's also something um, that you can go to the community college or go to an art school and become a sound engineer. 
um, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, you see their stamp on every single major motion picture. So that, that is a huge business and you can make a good living uh, with a certificate or, or a two year degree from a community college. Now, in terms of the technology, for example, like I was saying, I, I was able to buy a mixing station for my students. And so it's not like I didn't have to buy two technique turntables and, and, and a mix in, in the middle. I was able to buy a nice compact system that they can run from their from the PC and be able to mix music. Also, um, we have a digital drum set, which is really cool. So it was able to keep our footprint small on the stage and not necessarily always have the, the full um, drum set as well. Like I said, um, we also have a beat machine, um, but also making the beats solely from the computer. One of the things I've been also fascinated with are some of the uh, electric violins. I don't know if any of you've seen um, some hip hop violinists and all yep. the electric violins. Yep. That is that sound is very interesting, very interesting. And, and so that you know when we talk about music and in the intersection with with business, um, and and this is this is key. And so one of the one of the the trends we we sort of see one of the evolutions are some of the artists are actually. Uh, Doing doing their whole album start to finish, and, and even taking it a step further, doing the the marketing and, and branding. So, um, just going back to you, Doctor Doctor Spencer, on this, do, do you do you have any any groups or examples of, of young people using technology to put albums out in some of the success that they may have had? They may have. Well, I don't, I don't know about young people, but I, I know um, that was, I believe, one of Prince's really pushes and trying to get away from Warner Brothers. And I know that there was a point in time where he was only releasing um, new content online. And I believe a couple artists have, have released content online because of the revenue that they generate from the streaming services are really just pennies on the dollar. And so that they're trying to control their, their distribution of their art. One of the things with the development of technology, it has allowed people to distribute and to have more control over their intellectual property, whether it's music or other forms of entertainment. Right, right. Um, Dr. Dr. Um, Jones, do, do you have any insight on, you know, this this career paths that, that are have developed out of technology now and you're making music, you know, young folks doing it right in their, in their apartment? Well, I, the reason why I kind of brought up this subject is because I have nephews that are doing this. They're releasing their own small albums and they're trying to work on contracts with studios. And I think the wonderful thing about this is, is encouraging entrepreneurship in our community by giving them this exposure to the technology, how to use. I think what Dr. Spencer, Spencer is doing is wonderful in terms of showing them all the technology early in their lives and then they can be take that and work together to create their own music to create their own opportunity i think entrepreneurship needs to be encouraged more in this whole industry because a small segment of people get the same opportunity but i think if more young people are exposed to this it'll open up doors for them and, and, and I, I totally agree. And just two quick things I just want to add, just examples that I, I've seen play out. Uh, one of them is Jay-Z. And Jay-Z, just because, you know, he, he is so so wealthy, but beyond being wealthy, he's a, just a tremendous business person. You know, he he started uh, or invested in a, a, a music streaming service title. Mm -hmm. And so by doing that, you know, it's 100%, you know, 100 technology, but it also allowed him to own and control the product that he made and the product that his wife made and, and other artists on that platform. So that was a way to get into the distribution. And that's something that it has locked um, black uh, record companies out of. And, and you'll hear so many stories, you know, whether Motown or Master P or whoever, just so many folks. And then a, a second example is a Chance the Rapper out of Chicago, in which he hundred percent released his music himself free he released it free but uh what, what i've been able to learn about his business model 
is that he's leveraging the um, the advertisement from uh, your YouTube and your different providers. He has he has millions of people listening to his music, so he's actually getting ad revenue from that. And then by his brand being so established, he's created other products that he's selling. So he's sort of using music to leverage to sell other stuff. And you know he may get less money off off the unit, but he but he owns more of the percentage. And so mm-hmm. I think, you know, he's got a creative way and, you know, he's a multimillionaire several times over. So he has a viable way of, um, of, of doing it and, and moving forward. So um, uh, we will be right back after this commercial break. STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Join us for our monthly live stream on our website, stemforwardedu.org. Watch, subscribe, share. Also join our mailing list to stay up to date with STEM resources and opportunities. STEM Forward, the future is now. Watch, subscribe, share. Welcome back, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit the like button, and share our live stream with your friends. Let's jump back into this discussion. So we're moving on to segment two, technology in theater productions, technology in theater productions. So we're going to start off with uh, Dr. Dr. Spencer, and, and our listening audience, they, they may not know that uh, you actually have um, some expertise in the theater business. And so this question is going to go to you. Um, Technology in theater production. Talk to us about some of the everyday things that occur, whether it's a concert or a play or a dance recital. You know, how does technology intersect with with those those things? Well, well, first, I want to give a shout out to the Bushfire Theater Company and Mm -hmm. uh, on 52nd Street. one of my mentors, uh, that's his theater. And one of the things in telling our own stories, you know, black theater is very important. And so places like the bushfire, um, give black artists an opportunity to, to display and, and hone their work. So in the theater, just like we were talking about earlier, sound lighting, is a very big component of theater. Also, um, different technologies for for staging productions. Uh, For example, a couple years ago, my students were working with a big theater company downtown. And one of the things that they started doing was projecting the backgrounds. I was like, wow, that's kind of cool. Um, I was like, I could do the same thing in my school. So I, I got a projection system, you mm. know, installed in our school. So now we can project backgrounds onto the back wall for when we have productions uh, within the school. But you need a sound engineer. So like one of my friends who's in that union that I mentioned earlier, he, he's been a sound engineer at several theaters running the board because, you know, every actor is mic'd up. You know, and, and to make sure that, that people can hear, you know, throughout the theater, you know, that's important, whether and also lighting, you know, one of the things that's been um, developed or has been really pushed forward because of COVID, a lot of theaters have had to learn how to live stream because a lot of theaters over the last two years could not have uh, people come inside. So, you know, the element of video production also goes hand in hand. With, with theaters as well. Okay. And um, Dr. Jones, do you have any uh, observations in, in, in theaters and some of the engineering and lighting that takes place? Well, you know, I wanted to take um, the sound systems again and talk about engineers. So the engineers are designing the components that go inside that, that create the sound. The computer engineers are using the software, creating the software that runs the system wirelessly. 
the electrical engineers make sure that the power is delivered <laughs> to to give you the sound and then so you then say well what does a civil engineer do well a civil engineer builds the whole structure in which the theater is held so you can take one system and i didn't want to leave out chemical engineers chemical engineers make the the uh, covers of seats the seats themselves the plastics the shape the um theater, different aspects of material that are used in the theater. Chemical engineers do all that. So you can take one system and see how engineers affect a whole system. And certainly the sound systems are one of those systems that they're involved in creating, making them uh, better and better as well. Wow. Wow. So let, let's let's stay on this um, track with uh, with you, Dr. Dr. Jones. Um, talk to us about what what part does wireless play in in theaters yeah you know that so in the past everything had to be wired which made it a lot more difficult to get access to um making sure that everything in the theater flowed in the right way so now it doesn't matter where your position is at because you can take an ipad for example and work on that ipad to make the sound happen or to make the light, lights transition but you had to have a good uh, wireless system because that would wreck a whole theater if it's not working. You need someone that has expertise in those areas. So those looking for jobs, even in the theater, there's an opportunity to use some of that wireless technology and knowledge of software and programs to make everything run effectively. So it's really, really important. Um, I know I've been to the theater and I'm always amazed of all the lighting, how it's coordinated. They have it such that the sound and the lights can coordinate with one another. And that takes a feat to make that all happen and not uh, have a sense that it's um, not coordinated. So I think that's really important. Oh, that, that, that is, that is great. So, um, doc, um, Dr. Spencer, mm -hmm. You know, if we if we look at the cameras that are that are in theaters, are, are these cameras, you know, are, are they similar to the cameras everyone has in their pocket now? You know, is, is this just a you know small camera like that or is it something different and unique? Well, uh, a couple of things. I want to piggyback a little bit on what Steve said about the um, sound. One of the things that I had to learn in buying sound equipment, especially wireless sound equipment for my school's auditorium, is that the signals, the digital signals changed um, within the last, I guess, two years to 18 months. So some wireless devices that were working couldn't work on the same channels. So, so that's where a sound engineer, you know, comes into play to, to make sure that, that you're buying equipment that has a good shelf life. So you're not always <laughs> having to upgrade and, and to buy new equipment. And then it's the same thing with, with cameras. So um, in my school setting in our auditorium, which I'll call our theater, yes, we're, we're using um, HD camcorders that are 1080, you know, but in um, in a full production theater, you'll definitely use something commercial grade that, that can shoot in 1080 or 4K. Um, but the interesting thing about it, most people are still watching in 720. Huh. You know, like, like most people that are watching our live stream tonight, are probably watching in 720, even though we're, we're pushing it out at 1080 right now. So why is that? Um, a lot of the TVs can't can't do it, you know, unless you have a high definition TV that's doing 1080. And I, I'm not sure how many people actually pay attention uh, when they go to buy TVs and you get a new brand new LED TV. You know, you have to look in the fine print to see if it's, you know, 720 um, or 1080. I, I know one time. My father and I, we were out on a production shoot, and what we didn't know with the camera at the time, that the highest it went was 420 HD, which meant that the, that the video couldn't be expanded. It was a mess. Mm. <laughs> That's one of those, you live and you learn. <laughs> yeah, well, most definitely you live and you learn. <laughs> okay. So uh, we're going to take another pause for a commercial break. This is STEM Forward. TechCore 2 has a mission to develop a tech industry opportunity pipeline for urban youth from kindergarten to college to career entry. We have been providing year-round tech STEM career-related 
part-time Saturday employment, and internship opportunities to Philadelphia area college students for five years. Um, so I'm currently electrical engineering at Temple University in my junior year. Um, so for me, um, I needed something where I placed my values. I love kids and I wanted to find a place where I can, you know, give back to my community. I give back to kids. Some of those people I met in these programs, they're like my best friends. I still talk to them to this day. We're all in the STEM field. You know, those are the people who, you know, through college, it's like they'll keep pushing you and stuff like uh, So this exposure is great. You know, if, I'm a, if I was a parent listening to this, you want to share it. Uh, with other parents, uh, get their kids, you know, involved. You know? <laughs> All right. So yeah. tell us, tell us a, a, a highlight you had last summer working with the high school students. To be honest, the entire program it, it taught me a lot about myself, and it it kind of endorsed the skills that I believe that I had. I always knew that I was capable of being a leader, but I never knew I could lead my peers. With our strategic partnership with JCW Computer Consulting LLC. TechCore 2 is also a FIA work-study site and has employed students from Temple, Drexel, Lincoln University, Community College in Philadelphia, Widener University, Villanova, Cheney, and Howard University. Looking for your next great opportunity? Connect with us at collegejobs.techcore2.org. Are you frustrated with your do-it-yourself website project? Do-it-yourself website building is not as easy as some companies make it out to be. At Teaching Labs, let us help you with your website project. Through our remix services, we can turn your DIY template into a website that tells the story of your brand. Our remix services include logos, video, audio, images, and color schemes. Step into the Teaching Lab for a remix that doesn't skip a beat. Visit our website at teachitlabs.com and contact us now. Do you want your students to earn excellent grades? This is Dr. Stephen Jones, author of Seven Secrets of How to Study, the nationally recognized book, and my online course. The students in your organization can earn A-plus grades in just a few hours. Get the 7 Secrets of How to Study course for your students. You won't regret it. Welcome back. Welcome back and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel Hit the like button and share our live stream with your friends. Let's jump. Let's jump back in. We're talking about technology, and now we're moving into uh, enjoying life, celebrating life. So, technology. This is our, our third segment. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, technology in sports, and so we're going to go right to Dr. Jones because many folks didn't know Dr. Jones <laughs> was was a beast running back in college. <laughs> so, so tell us how does how does technology impact sports nowadays? Yeah, now you now you're telling how old I am because we had no technology when I played. <laughs> but I watched the game today, and the the quarterbacks are getting they have uh, things in their ears to hear from the coach. Um, the equipment that they're using uh, is developed by technology to be safer. Um, we used to have concussions back in the day. They would actually take smelling sauce and you know try to wake us up and send us right back out into the game. Uh, today, they're actually trying to make safer helmets so that individuals don't get concussions. So, you know, again, I'm always talking about engineering, but the engineers are helping to design that. The players are then giving feedback about that. Uh, physically fit the the technology that they're using to measure the strength and the speed of athletes is different. So you see a stronger athlete, a, a faster athlete, and even some of the big guys, you know, the ones that you know, those ones that are like six, seven, three hundred and some pounds, 
uh, and they run down running backs because <laughs> they're using different technology to to prepare them to go out on the field. Um, but then there's also the technology that's blossoming with the people who are taking care of the athletes. So the the physicians that are taking care of them, the um, the trainers that are taking care of them, all of them are evolving in how they exercise and ensure that the players can go out and safely play. So there are many different elements of it that help them to be successful when they're on the field. Uh, and using that technology is is blossoming through the use of computers and how it can be used and how it can help the players to play in a safer way, especially today. Again, looking at the NFL specifically, when they, they've added more games and more games to the season, which makes for more opportunities for players to have injuries. So you need greater protection in those circumstances. You bring up some um, some some great points. Um, so, doc, Dr. Spencer, how do you see technology technology you know playing out in the uh, sports arena? Well, I, I came a little after Steve, but I do remember one day being in my garage at home, seeing my my father's football helmet from the 1950s, and, and that was a scary sight. I mean, it was no padding whatsoever, so they, they had no protection. But one of the things that I say to my students. And Steve kind of alludes to it, you know, um, there's a lot of engineering that goes on. So there's a lot of physics. There's a lot of um, geometry in, in terms of um, the angle of impact and, and, and how helmets are kind of dispersing the energy of the impact throughout the helmet. So, so it's not concentrated in one place on the head. Also, when it comes to um, uh the shoulder pads, I remember my shoulder pads were mostly plastic. Uh, nice. One of the things I think about when, when Allen Iverson first started wearing that compression sleeve, I believe it, it was a tube sock with the end cut off. You know, now everybody's wearing some type of compression, um, whether it's for the legs, for the arm or for the torso. Um, but that's just another way that shows how technology has evolved whether it's the fabrics that they use. Um, the, the, if you think about what, when the famous runs Earl Campbell and how, you know, having his whole jersey almost ripped away, I don't even think you can grab somebody's jersey at this point, you know, it, just because of the, the, the new materials um, that are developed that, that are used in sports, whether it's um, soccer and, you know, they call it football all over the rest of the world whether it's American football, basketball, tennis, or whatever. I mean, think about how sneakers have evolved in the last 40 years. You know, and, and that, that's an engineering feat. You know, when when Phil Knight, you know, actually used the waffle maker and some, and some plastic to make the first uh, sole, mm -hmm. you know, for his prototype. Now, wow. you bring up uh, another point, and that is that the molding on the bottom of the cleats, those mm -hmm. used to be screwing. <laughs> you mm -hmm. screw in I remember then, that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you would actually, you know, once they start wearing down, replace them. But one of the problems is they had metal in them and they would wear down. And that metal would, you know, when you get stepped on by a cleat, that metal would hit your hand and it would be horrible. So they came up with a one piece mold on the bottom of the, the cleat that makes it more effective and less costly even to produce. So, you know, uh, you're bringing, you're just bringing back some, just some, some crazy memories with some of the evolution in sports and how technology has improved it. But let's think of something that's just a lot simpler, you know, a simple piece of technology, which is just, you're, you know, you're shooting, you used to shoot film. Now you're shooting video straight to digital. So you're shooting video, but in in professional sports, whether we're talking about soccer, football, basketball, even baseball, the you know the the instant replay, you know how has this impacted the game? So, Doctor Spencer, um, it's 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 affected the game tremendously. I, I know, I believe in baseball this last year. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about using technology to call balls and strikes 
because the, the umpire, the strike zone is wildly different from umpire to umpire. But when you read the rules of baseball, it is tightly defined. You know, so at this point, there is technology that could do a better job than the human. But removing the umpire from call, calling balls and strikes, you know, how would that affect the, the integrity of, of the game? Or, you know, you know, baseball has been around for a long time. You know, how different would it look not having an umpire back there calling the balls and strikes? But um, I think some of the football games, you know, with the zip camera that, you know, goes right over the line, you know, and, and just how close you can get to the players on the field. And, and if you have a high definition TV or 4K, T, uh, 4K TV, the, the view is just tremendous. It's like you're almost there. You know, and they think about how uh, virtual reality is coming out. I was just telling somebody, the only way I would, I would use VR would be for like a sporting event or a, um, or a concert or something like that. Wow, it, that's interesting. So, so Dr. Um, Jones, you know, if you think about software engineers, um, look at the, the games that have come out that are that are, are sports games. So how are the software engineers, you know, marrying this, you know, the athletics and, and technology? They again, I had to go back in history when they first came out with these these games. Um, you know, they were very mechanical in how they operated. And now, because of the new technology and the software that they're developing, these these it looks like the individuals who you're watching in these video games could jump out of the screen and actually play in front of you. It's a whole nother visual level. And now you have these leagues that people are able to start and you know and have players from different teams. And so and and then the the wonderful thing is. I can compete against someone from across the United States on my electronic unit. So it's a whole different level of the use of technology. And esports is growing to a multi million dollar industry and opportunity for, bo for both sides of it. Um, there are a lot of people who are doing all the programming, creating the opportunity in it. And I would like to see more students of color get into this industry. Like we're in very small numbers, like 0.005% of those who are designing the esports and engaged in it are people of color. So this is an opportunity for us to get engaged in something where there's job opportunities, there's entrepreneurial opportunities, and esports is just going to continue to grow as I see it. And it's another form of inter electronic entertainment. We're talking about entertainment today. Um, you know, I was thinking about something else too. And some of the stadiums now, you can sit there and order food to come to your chair while you're in the stadium. So you can get on your cell phone, use the software to send it and place the order, pay for it, and it'll arrive in your chair while you're watching the game. What a different use of entertainment and technology. Absolutely. So, um, uh, Dr. Spencer, I want to pull you into this, and, and I just pulled something up real quick. Um, um, a, a really big news announcement. Microsoft actually purchased Activision, uh -huh. and, they, and they paid $68.7 billion for Activision. Uh -huh. So, Dr. Spencer, why do you think Microsoft did that? They, so... When, when Microsoft decided to change their name to Meta and, and talk about the Metaverse, you know, you, you need content for this virtual reality that you're trying to build. So with Microsoft's acquisition of uh, Activision, you know, Activision is one of the oldest um, gaming companies out there, and they have tremendous titles that give Microsoft all types of content. So it allows Microsoft to bring that content into their virtual world and also gives them a good stable platform for their um, gaming console units as well. You know, so th this is the fight for the VR universe, you know, and, and they want to have as much content as possible. It's similar 
to what um, some entertainment companies were doing a couple of years ago, buying up you know various newspapers and magazines because they wanted their their content. Right. Absolutely. Um, I I had went to a actually an esports conference, and this was for resellers back right before COVID. So March of 2020, I was in Arizona at a conference, and I learned some 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 really key things there. For for one, Microsoft at that point was um, they they made a significant investment in the esports, and they started actually sponsoring players. So they had a young man at that time. They were paying twenty million dollars a year mm. to play games with the Microsoft logo, and they they were doing that then. And and one of the other things that came out was that esports back in twenty twenty was making more money than the NFL and Hollywood mm-hmm. esports, mm-hmm. and so with it generating so much revenue, whether it's from the game developer side, whether it's from these communities, you, you have whole worlds that are existing that people are, are, are just living on. I mean, they're spending more time in this in, in this uh, virtual world than, than a regular world. And, and you actually have fans who pay to watch people play. Yes. So it's, you know, it, it, I, I couldn't believe it was it was so large. So and at that time, you had several universities had adopted esports. So now they have esports teams. They're competing against each other, and they even have a caveat from a uh, from a student athlete perspective. It's actually more advantageous to be an esports player because if you go to school and you on an esports team, the competitions you play in, you actually get paid like a professional, but you're still considered a college student. Mm-hmm. So it's it's interesting that now things have evolved some. You see what what the NCAA has done, and they're allowing folks to uh, if you're you know if you're actually playing basketball, you're playing football, you now can make some money from it. But esports was ahead of the game. So you know this this is a, a whole industry that, like to your point, Doctor Spencer, as a community, we need to look more um, closely at it. And, and lastly, I'll say that esports is is something that um, Tech Core Two is. Um, you know, we're dipping our toe in, and we're slowly going to be bringing uh, uh, different programs on uh, on tap for for our young folks. So I don't know if Dr. Spencer, if you had anything you wanted to share on just that whole, you know, um, e, you know, esports or, or just the evolution. Yeah, my my alma mater, Morgan State University, has a esports team. Okay, you know. Okay. Um, if, if you look at the entertainment industry, it's a multi-trillion dollar industry. Multi-trillion. So that's because there's so many facets. We, we've talked about engineering. We've talked about chemistry. Everything, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and art is in the entertainment industry. You know, you need engineers for, for all types of things, for sets, lighting, sound. You need artists for the backgrounds. Like, I, I, it's this, um, uh, I was watching this episode of uh, a Marvel show, and it was talking about, they were talk, showing these cosplay players that dress up in Marvel, and one of them had their day job was actually a video game um, character designer. Wow. And, you know, she's, and she's using an intricate drawing pad and drawing these different figures. And one of the reasons that I believe they said they hired her was because she actually knew how to sew it and make these things in real life. Hmm. You know, so there's a lot of skills that, that our children can learn K to 12 that, that can put them in a sustainable uh, career and in the industry. Um that they can have a lot of fun and make an impact and, and also control the narrative and, and tell and tell a story. Wow. So, um, Dr. Jones, um, at your university, uh, do you, are you offering, is your university offering anything in the esports arena? We actually are doing it through our law school. Our law school is heavily involved in the sports industry. So I think 
that they're going to be the ones that help negotiate contracts and opportunity in sports. They have various opportunities um, where we are inviting people to campus to have uh, almost like many conferences on these topics. And that's an area that many of our law school students are, are interested in. So we are, we're dipping our foot into it as well. And one of the things I was thinking about in addition to getting involved, our college, the College of Engineering, is getting our students involved in entrepreneurship. So it's not only about you being an engineer, you could be an entrepreneur and start your own business in esports or in these areas of technology coming out um, into your, your um, profession. And, and also a lot of times today, even though individuals are coming out to work for a specific company, they are almost like consultants within that company because of the knowledge that they bring to bear from their college experience. And that's the way that I think that, you know, the technology, the opportunities for the entertainment industry to expand to the colleges and open doors for the college students to be a part of it. Um, we have to, to me, we really have to prepare these young people for these different careers. I think John, uh, Dr. Spencer for what he's doing, but we need to take that knowledge that of what he's doing and translate that to other schools. Because one of the things that that does is it gets students excited about coming to school every day. That's the right. goal. So right. if we're not showing them how the knowledge that they're obtaining applies to something, then we'll, our children will always be stuck and they'll not be interested in the education that, that we're providing for them. So I think this is a great topic. We need to you know make sure that as the industry of entertainment and technology is blossoming, that we're not the, at the end of it, that we're at the creation part of it and making it happen. You, you bring up some valid points, and I, and I want to pull Dr. Spencer in here because you, you touched on something that, you know, he, he's our resident expert. So Dr. Spencer is a principal. He's, he's currently uh, working in the, uh, uh, you know, a large, one of the largest school districts in the area. And he's just done just some phenomenal things in, in, in the STEM arena. So, Dr. Spencer, like we we know um, what drives the, the, the children's desire to be in school. We, we know it, you know, creating this excitement and, and that excitement can can manifest itself in so many different areas. You know, if, if the school or the teachers, the principal is creative. So what's the problem? Why don't we have more classrooms with this excitement? Well, one of the things that Steve said earlier, you have to have an entrepreneurial spirit um, to, to raise the money because um, depending on what district you're in, there's not a lot of extra funds to do these activities um, that I've talked about. Most of the activities I've talked about has been a result of me being able to raise money and, and to partner with other organizations to bring things in to the school. Because I, I have so many children I tell me, I wanna be a YouTuber, you know, I wanna be a rapper, I wanna be this, I wanna be that. So one of the things that I try to do as an educator, show them, okay, you wanna be a YouTuber? I need to show you how to storyboard, okay? Mm -hmm. Because believe it or not, they're not just randomly getting on camera videotape it themselves. They're using editing software. They are planning out what they're going to do. So that's why this English language arts class is important because mm -hmm. you need to be able to write out what you are doing. Same thing, you know, with, with music, you have to be able to plan and tell a story, you know? So I try to also connect it to what they're learning in school while making it fun. Because making it fun, you know, kind of kind of pulls them in. So I try to have as many programs as possible to to give children, you know, glimpses, exposure to the various paths that they can go on, and let them know that if, if you get this education, you know, if you work hard, you know, there can be light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. Thank you for that. So you've been listening to STEM Ford Entertainment Technology and Celebrating Life Edition. Uh, my name is Joel Wilson. I'm with uh, TechCore2 Nonprofit Corporation and JCW Computer Consulting. And I just want to encourage you, let everyone know that our spring coding classes are coming back starting the first Saturday in April. 
And you can get on, uh, sign up on our interest list. You just go to survey.techcore2.org, survey.techcore2.org. And uh, you can see our whole list of classes. We have brand new classes for the year. And we have a new scholarships that we're going to be offering to all Philadelphia students. So if you're in Philadelphia and, and you want to attend and, and, you know, mom or dad or your guardian, grandma, grandpa, don't have a, a the cost for the funds. We have a scholarship that will take care of all of that. Uh, Dr. Jones. Well, one of the things that we offer at Villanova is uh, we have a summer program. And so typically the summer program has been um, on campus, but of, of course, unfortunately, because of COVID, we've had to make it online. So within the next couple of weeks, I'm going to roll out the application, which will be online for students to fill out. There is a cost for the summer program, but it's not too expensive. And the student will spend an entire week learning every aspect of engineering. In cost fact, for the summer program, but it's not too expensive. And so, in fact, the actual students that are involved in the program come from around the country. So it's a great experience. And if you'd like to learn more about that, you can send an email to me at s.jones at villanova.edu. Wow, thank you, thank you. And Dr. Uh, Spencer. Well, one of the things um, as, as a K-8, to K-12 to principal is developing partnerships um, with people like yourselves or organizations like yourselves, like, like Joel's program actually runs out of my school. Um, I was able to do that through through grant funding, but it gives my children an opportunity that they wouldn't necessarily have during the day. You know, we don't necessarily have um, time to, to talk about Python, uh, even programming in Roblox and for Fortnite and things of that nature, Grasshopper. Um, and then working with Dr. Jones, we've run mentor programs in, in various schools and things like that over the years. So developing uh, partnerships, relationships to make sure that you can bring in, you know, various pieces and, and experiences to your students is, is very important. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, we wish everyone to have a, a Good night. Hopefully you found some enjoyment and value from this segment. And, and just remember, come back every month, stem forward, get a new edition. Thank you.